I think the first thing we got to do is say thank you to the person who's sponsoring this for us this evening, Mr. Alan Schaefer. <laughs> We thank all of you for attending. Uh, this is a part of our speaker series, so we're going to have these all the time. And different people, like uh, you're planning on some for, you might tell them who we got planned. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would have to be prepared for that piece of paper. <laughs> of our curator, we have a long list of paleontologists, uh, meteorite specialists, geologists, sedimentologists, and all of the ologists that we're going to pull from. We're already scheduling that out for 2023. We plan on having about 24 presentations like this. Uh, and you know, one of them is going to be the old plank road, and we're anxious to have it. And I don't know if anybody attended the last time we had an old plank road presentation. It is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. The information and what happened in that old plank road. So we're going to have those. Uh, I wanted to introduce uh, Abigail Kerr. She is our office manager. And downstairs, we have Fred Darrow, who was at the front desk. He's our general manager. So they're here. Uh, <laughs> Abigail's going to give you some information. You all paid to get in here, unless you had an annual membership or a family membership. So she's going to offer you a special deal for this evening while you're here. Yes, if anyone would like to um, purchase a membership, either annual or family today, you can apply the cost of your ticket, presuming that you paid for your ticket tonight, <laughs> uh, uh, towards the cost of that membership. Our annual membership is $40. It grants you unlimited uh, admission into the museum and 10% off in our gift shop. And then our family membership is gives you two membership cards. It's $100. It gives you two membership cards. And anytime you want to come here with that membership, you can bring in two adults and any number of children under 12. So it's really good if you have kids, grandkids, or if you'd like to be able to bring a guest with you, you can just bring them in with that membership as well. And that's $100, and it's a, a year-long membership. Um, and yeah, it'll get you into almost all of our events are free for members. Uh, they usually are just normal admissions, so free for members. Very few of them so far have had any additional fee, and we are ramping up our events as we go. So I hope that some of you will find a lot of value out of that. So thank you for that. Uh, the annual membership or family membership is the best babysitting tool I've ever had. <laughs> it's snowing, raining, or anything else is going on. The kids come in here, the grandkids, and I dump them off here. So, <laughs> we actually, all summer, we did have Wednesday workshops where we had uh, kid-focused workshops. And once school started, we started up our discovery play dates, which are focused on the pre-K, so the kids who aren't in school yet. So we do have a lot of kid-focused activities that you can kind of just bring them in as long as they don't burn the place down. We'll entertain them for a couple hours. <laughs> well, thank you for that warning. <laughs> okay, folks. Anybody got any questions about the family membership or the annual membership? You can ask it. Uh, Abigail, she'll be downstairs. And again, anybody that paid to get in here, take their money downstairs, they'll apply it to your annual membership is $40. Oh, so. 25% of us in this room. So, okay, we're going to start up with our guest speaker, who is Chad McCain. Chad McCain is a cave surveyor and member of the local Simo Grotto out of Perryville, Missouri, also a member of the National Spelog... Spelological. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to say that. Uh, Speleological Society and the Cave Research Foundation. Besides mapping caves for private landowners, mostly in the St. Genevieve and Perry counties, he also does survey work for the National Park Service in Mammoth Cave National Park, Ozark National Scenic Riverways, and the Mark Twain National Forest. In addition to that, he walks on water. <laughs> <laughs> here when I moved to the area 14 years ago. 
Um, at that time, this cave had just been found in St. Jimmy County, uh, and the, the survey was being spearheaded by Chris Hartman, who you can see here in the, uh, the first photo. Uh, it's actually a visit from I haven't seen in a while. But, you know, we, we, this cave went from being zero miles to six and a half to seven and a quarter almost in the span of about, what was that, three years, something like that. We, we were in this cave uh, all the time, almost every weekend, it seemed like, uh, you know, and it, it consumed many of our lives for a while. Um, some of you I know, some of you know, actually quite a few people in here used to, well, we used to park either in your driveway, in your yard, or you have maps of mine and Chris's hanging in your, your whatever, whatever you did with them, I don't know, after you, you know, we uh, gave them to you. But anyway, if you didn't know, St. Genevieve County is kind of a hot spot for caving. It is connected to the Perry County car system, which looks like we have a little bit of a lag time here. But anyway, you can see these, these hot spots kind of tell you where are the caves in Missouri. I'm sure everybody's heard Missouri's the cave state. This is why. Right now, there's around 7,600 caves in Missouri turned in, and about 950 of them are in Perry County and St. Genevieve County combined. Now, when this cave was found, it was only the 74th cave turned in in St. Genevieve County. Now, Alex, what are we up to? 250, 260, something like that? Yeah. There, there's a bunch, okay? And that's just, when I say that, these are caves that cavers know about and track and log and map and just, you know, visit from time to time when we can get permission. Um, other areas, as you can see, Shannon County, uh, Green County, uh, I forget what that one is. Oh, that is Shannon. Uh, was that Pulaski? You know, those are those are the hot spots. A lot of caves. Um, uh, now, the deal with the the caves in this county is there were a lot of cavers going to Perry County back in the day, and they were just blasting through St. Genevieve County on the way down, and they overlooked two very big cave systems. In 2007, Black Fathom was found, and it was started mapping. And then on the other side of the interstate, we found another cave lay. Then I don't think it was six or seven years ago. That's just under five miles long right now. Uh, but, but nobody in St. Louis cared about St. Genevieve County. The big caves were being found in Perry County at that time. In Perry County, you've got a 31-mile cave, crevice cave. You've got a 24-and-a-half-mile cave called the Moore Cave System, and they are right on top of each other, right in the town of Perryville. Okay. That's what everybody from St. Louis was after. When, when you talk about big caves, you know, Black Fatten has a lot of crawling. Uh, I just did a six and a half mile trip in the crevice this weekend with a college group uh, from Rolla, and uh, we walked for about six hours of that six and a half. Um, so anyway, they didn't care about St. Genevieve County. Nobody knew anything about it until Simo Grotto came along or about this cave, went to it, found it, started mapping it, and it was kind of a, one of those anomalies. Uh, you look at maps, you look at topographic maps, pull up any topographic map of St. Genevieve County, Perry County, it's loaded with sinkholes. If I'm not mistaken, there's over 10,000 sinkholes in that car's plane. This cave is not located in a sinkhole, so it wasn't as easy to find. You had to you walked up a draw and all of a sudden, the valley down cut into the cave, and there it was. Uh, so uh, the river cave, though, gets its name uh, because of the water. But this is a cave that we learned, you know, quite, quite off, uh, right off the bat. You don't go in there when there's a chance of rain. Okay. Uh, this map kind of shows just a, a quick segment here where we enter the cave, and it, it goes down to the lower, lower sump of the cave. That's kind of what was discovered. There were water lines in there. Obviously, the landowner was pumping water out to, to water their cattle uh, or whatever else. But there was really no signs that anybody had ever been upstream and maybe just a little bit downstream. But the guys started going downstream, and they knew right away they had something special because you crawl in the entrance, and it immediately opens up. And you have rimstone dams and these big draperies. You've got flooded sections. You've got, uh, you know, Stalactites all over the ceilings. Uh, isn't this the chocolate other room? I think uh, you know it's on the map. You know, yeah. And, and they knew they were going downstream. That, that okay, we found something here, and they started mapping the cave. 
you know. Uh, the whole cave is filled with these yellow and brown and black formations. Uh, but again, this was 15 years ago. There was there was just nothing like this found in the area. Everything in Perry County, while it's huge, it's not really decorated like this cave is. This cave, hands down, start to finish, no matter, even if it's a terrible side passage, there's something growing out of the walls trying to seal the cave up. Sometimes we call it cave cancer. So this, this is the downstream section, right? Easy going, but it just ends. The water meets the ceiling. We call that a sump, and we can't go any further. Okay? If I'm not mistaken, at that point, it's still something like a quarter mile from the spring that it, that it comes out of. But then we get to survey, right? So you may wonder, well, how do you map a cave? Well, you're basically playing connect the dots. And back then, they were stringing tape measures. They were floating in inner tubes. They had rafts because this water was 14 to 17 feet deep. Uh, fortunate for me, I was not around for this part. <laughs> <laughs> Chris and the guys, they handled it all it well. It was cold. And it was cold, right? It wasn't moving fast. And it was just, you know, they basically had to, to invent a way to map the cave. Uh, usually if it's walking, it's easy. You put a dot on the wall, you put a dot on that wall, you measure the compass bearing, the inclination for vertical control, and you string a tape. Um, now we do it a little different uh, because we have electronic devices, but you know, that water, the deep water, we even, I wish I had photos in here, but we used to take canoes into the cave and we would canoe the first thousand feet until we hit this place called the tar pit, the Roman bath, uh, and the, uh, which is before the wind tunnel. The water may not have been deep for swimming that whole way, but you could float a canoe pretty much unobstructed that whole way, uh, which was really cool when I came along because I knew nothing, and then all of a sudden we're mapping this cave and we're canoeing through it, and it's like, oh, this is crazy, you know? But survey continued. The guys did what they could. Um, they were in the deep water. They're surveying through. They're, you can see Chris here is wearing a, a life jacket. He's got a hoodie on. He's trying to stay warm. Uh, he's trying to sketch, uh, you know, with the field paper that we use, which is pretty water resistant, but it wasn't 100% waterproof. Um, but again, this is, this is all through the section that we would float the canoes through uh, up until we, we basically hit that first natural barrier where the cave really shut down. And this was a place called the Roman Bath. And up here behind Richard in this photo is a little crawlway. It's not very long, maybe a body, body length and a half, but the airflow through it was tremendous. I remember the first time that I went through it, it was, it was like, wow, this is cold. And that wasn't even the wind tunnel. The wind tunnel after that, was aptly named, but you were swimming. You couldn't touch bottom, and again, you're swimming through just enough airspace and the wind to blast you in the face, and the whole time, if you know anything about caves, if there's airflow, it's gonna go a long ways. Unless it's point-based cave on the other side of town, which goes like 300 feet, but the airflow is amazing, and it's, no, nothing. But anyway, finally, finally, the guys were able to get out of the water. And they're mapping, and this section of the cave really is pretty cool. You've got the gravel, you're easy walking. There's old formations that have been undercut and walking away. But you can see Chris sketching, and he's sketching off the tape. Back in the day, that's what we would do. Once we pulled that survey shot and laid the tape on the ground, and then you can just walk along the tape, kind of eyeballing side to side, and that's how you draw. You start drawing the plan and do the map, which is a segment of it is over here in the corner, uh, which is the... Uh, uh, the Black Fathom Pit entrance, which I'll talk about later. Um, moving on, this section of cave, it, it stays pretty much easy walking for about 45 minutes of easy travel upstream, and I use easy travel in air quotes, of course. Uh, there, there are a few sections for crawling, um, but I'm taller than, than a lot of people. Uh, other people can walk where I have to finally, right, I'm, I'm I'm crawling. I can't do the walking. When I came along, the Passage of Disappointment, aptly named, it's a flooded section, yay much air, that's 20 feet wide or so, but you know, everybody just kind of had the feeling the cave was dying out and that was it and, you know, the excitement was dying. So I got involved and Chris took me on a trip upstream with two other people and uh, we pushed through this passage of disappointment, which again, it wasn't hard, it was just, it just looked grim. You know, it really looked like the cave wasn't gonna go much further, but there was a lot of airflow. Well, in this 
area, you know, there's a few formations here and there, this really strange blob, but even in this flooded section, you know, there's a lot to look at. One thing about the cave is there is a lot of fish in it, or at least there used to be, okay? When I mean fish, I'm talking three foot long catfish, carp, big mouth buffalo, and they would beat you to death. For all of these. And, and if you were the first one in, you could see them, right? And you could smack them behind you so that they hit everybody else. <laughs> this, this is not a, a fossil that's in, it's in the bedrock. This is probably where a fish died, landed on the flowstone, the flowstone partially encased it, and that's what you got. There's a couple snake fossils in the cave as well. Same scenario, they just landed in that perfect spot, got calcited in, and they're still there. Um, but anyway, back to the passage of disappointment, it eventually popped up. And it popped up into this area that we call the Rimstone Room. Again, huge, massive flowstones. Whoops, went back the wrong way. Massive flowstones, again, with the white and the yellow colors and the black. The black is everywhere. Uh, I don't think really think the cave was named after that, it just so happened that there is so much manganese oxide in this cave, everything is black. And the name that Hartman gave the cave, it turned out to be a very aptly named cave. Uh, stage curtains were, were up high. Uh, again, you know, and while, while all this is going on, you know, we're looking and finding, okay, where's the safe zone at? Because it's inevitable it's going to rain while you're underground, right? It's it's just inevitable. Well, bad news is in this whole section of the cave, no matter how they got floods the ceiling everywhere. I think there's 38 foot ceiling areas. We put fishing bobbers, shoved wire in the ground, built little platforms. We'd go back after, uh, oh gosh, the May 8th to Rico that flattened all the trees, 2008. That was what that rain, that flood coming down the, the valley at the beginning of the presentation was. Knocked every single bobber 38 feet high off. So, okay, note to self. Uh, we're, we're, not, we're not going to this cave when there's, what, 20, 30% chance of the rain. That was like a high end. We never had a close call in, in the years we mapped in this cave uh, because it was just, you know, we always say, you know, 30% chance of rain, that's also 30% chance of dying. And, you know, let's just put it off for another weekend where it's 5% or zero, preferably. Um, so the cave eventually pops up keeps getting bigger, uh, but it stays heavily decorated throughout the whole thing. Um, these are these are long since abandoned, um, and by that I mean when you go in there, they're not constantly running with water. They're not actively growing. The water has been <coughs> routed somewhere else and is making something else. Um, this area had a, a lot of draperies. I think this was called the, uh, the Hall of Pork, and unfortunately I don't have a great photo of it, but on like right here, it could also be called like the tobacco leaf room because the, the draperies are old, they're dead, but they're just coated with black uh, manganese and they just look like what you see of a photo in Kentucky of, of uh, you know, tobacco leaves hanging in a barn. They were everywhere. Um, but eventually, we pushed through and we got to an area that opened up and Chris and I really thought it was a safe zone. So we called the base camp and we decided to had a survey and it was terrible. Um, <laughs> but we, we got a lot mapped uh, and the whole time again we thought this area surely is high and dry because the stream comes in and we hit a dry upper level and we got this little thing off to the side and it's kind of flat, kind of not really, but good enough let's bring cave packs in here and let's set up our tarps and our sleeping bags and candles and, and let's just camp out the whole weekend and get a ton mapped. That's about as flat as it was. You know, it wasn't great. And no, it is not high and dry. That whole area goes completely underwater. Uh, but leading off this, this junction way, uh, it, it, we hit one of the more heavily decorated sections of the cave, and it was the first side passage where there was no water. Okay? Basically, the stream was flowing in a, in a passage down here, and we were up here in the old, old, old section of the cave. Long since dead, nothing flows through it, but the formations that are growing through it, they were extremely abundant. I remember it was Chris, myself, and, and Bobcat, he's a, he's a local <laughs> caver. Uh, we discovered this area, and I just remember, you know, I was so new, I still, I, I had no idea just how special this was. 
you know, when we're walking through and you got all these massive columns, uh, and, and this, if I remember right, those photos you just saw, that was, that was not the day of discovery, but it was the very next trip, if I remember right. So that was, those were really taken in real time. We were actively mapping through. Now, during the 2015 convention in Waynesville, I, I, I led a trip through uh, the cave for basically anybody that, that wanted to come. And, you know, it just so happened I was able to take the, the photographer for the NSS News into the cave, and he, he's a professional photographer, and he took some amazing photos of this same area. But, you know, back when we were taking pictures, it was cheap point-and-shoot cameras on a crappy tripod, and everybody turn your lights off and hold still, and you hit a flash, and there's a photo, and now we just walk through it with a phone, click, better photo than that one was, click. You know, it blows everything away. Um, but but kind of what we did back then is we would survey for eight or ten hours and then we would mess around for an hour, hour and a half and take photographs. Now, what was kind of special about this, uh, this upper trunk line, um, we're going through it and if I remember right, Bobcat saw these coral fossils sticking out of the wall and he just immediately stopped and again, I'm like, what are you guys talking about? I don't know anything. Well, in the limestone, there are fossils around here. Uh, Prevalent is the Ragosa coral uh, colony fossils, and this particular one is about this big. Uh, and unfortunately, it's kind of in a section where you can't get to it. So it's really hard to get anything for scale. But, you know, these, these little fins of all the, the coral colonies, and again, this was just a plant that lived in the sea, whatever the, however old the rock unit is, and it's around 240 million years old. So when Missouri was underwater, you know, these coral colonies were growing everywhere. Um, this is right at the junction, though, where that upper level and the stream comes back together. And now, that's right here, where it, uh, right at the Pillars of Hercules, which we got to, and you know, we were all just ecstatic. You know, again, me being a new caver, Chris and Bobcat, they'd never found anything like this before. We were just coming on blue that we found this. And I remember when we broke into this whole section of the cave, Hartman was saying, man, we're going to be surveying this cave for the rest of our lives, <laughs> thinking it's going to be another big cave like Perry County because those caves are still going today. Well, okay, it went seven miles and it, it, it you know, it, it's still going, but it, 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 it's going pretty terrible. But these are the two pillars that we ended up calling, or actually Chris named this area the Pillars of Hercules. So we aptly named, heavily decorated. Um, what's that? Oh, I didn't know if there's a question. Oh, uh, 22 feet tall and about, I don't know, two feet in diameter. But there's also signs laying on the floor there that there were more of them. They just simply collapsed, fell down, and then these grew in their way. There's a lot of that in this cave. So this is, a, this is an area right before you get to that, though. This goes up through the ceiling another 15 feet or so. But again, as you can tell from the look at it, glassy smooth, that is long since dead. Water hasn't flowed down to form this in, in a long time. But one of the other benefits of bringing the, uh, the, the cables from, uh, like, I had a group in from Utah, uh, and when the guy told me his name, I knew exactly who he was. This is Andy Armstrong, and, you know, a very big name caber all over the United States. He surveys, in, you know, basically everywhere. So he came along on the trip, and one of the benefits is, is you get a different perspective for people who've never been in the cave, and he finds this formation that looks like a boot. And he's like, hey man, I'm gonna stick my head up here, and you guys can get a picture, it looks like a boot. <laughs> <laughs> How did we never see that? But uh, he saw it, and so yeah, we had a lot of fun that day. And then, uh, you, know, with, you know, it was a fun trip with these cavers from out west, you know, they, they they were at the presentation I gave, and they, they showed up in Perry County at our NSS post-convention camp out and led the trip again in the Black Fathom. Um, this shot that Dave Bunnell took ended up being on the cover of the NSS News. Uh, it's only the second Missouri cave to make the cover, um, which was pretty special from that aspect. But again, you know, if you have a, a, a cave photographer, a professional in there, you definitely want to take advantage. It's like, oh, I know we're here. Let's go here, go here, go here. You know, he, he took, he took photos of stuff in, in seconds that, you know, we, we tried to, we have a lot of terrible photos <laughs> <laughs> from, from all this stuff. But again, this is all, you know, right in the heart of the cave where the two stream passages crisscross, the whole cave makes this helix looking double figure eight thing going on. 
and uh, you know, it looks like there's something up there. And no, there's not. We had a ladder. It's still in the cave. It was brought in from two miles away. <laughs> Terrible. One of the worst trips ever. But anyway, we stuck it in every hole we could see, thinking, oh, this has got to go. But you know, this is this is a different perspective looking back the other way. So again, this is kind of the big room in the cave, and. Now it's only about 15 minutes from the pit entrance that we have. So if, if I want to take somebody in the cave, uh, I can get people here and they don't have to wear a wetsuit. But when we were mapping this cave, this was two and a half hours from the entrance. So we're getting we're getting out there and think, you know, think of it this way, two and a half hours in is usually three to three and a half hours out just because you're tired. And we weren't doing short trips because we didn't want to go two and a half hours one way, survey for two hours, and then come out because we got the whole day. We kind of looked at it, well, I, I got permission from the wife to go in on Saturday. It doesn't matter if I come out at seven or midnight. She's, the day's trashed anyway. So, you know, we did a lot of long trips and we were getting into this section. It was like, wow, we need to find another entrance to the cave. Where's this airflow coming? And the thing about big caves, airflow can mean two entrances, or it can just mean it's a really, really big cave that breathes on its own. Okay, it does happen. But again, you know, this is an upper level section uh, in that same area. Unfortunately, that 2008 storm where it flooded and flattened all those trees and wiped that formation out, it's no longer why it's covered on mud still to this day. But this picture was actually taken on uh, Friday. And one of the guys snapped a shot, and this is walking in between the pit entrance and the, uh, the pillar section. And you know, we've, we've never photographed this part of the cave. But again, it's getting out there, and the hunt was on for another uh, another entrance. And we did find a couple. Uh, in the in the middle of all that is this place called the catwalk. And in the catwalk area, there's there's flow stones that that you know these cave formations. They literally take minutes to walk past. And if you go to a show cave, if you go to Merrimack Caverns or Onondaga or any of the other Missouri show caves, yeah, they're heavily decorated, they're big, they're huge, but you're not walking past a drapery for minutes at a time. And I'm not kidding when I say that. Now, this one is the only part of this minutes long flowstone that's still flowing. Uh, and earlier this summer, I took my son in and made him stand in the freezing cold water from the wet suit. <laughs> you know, whatever, it's fun. You're having fun, darn it, smile. <laughs> Same section, but you know, the flowstone is still in there. And again, this was this weekend's trip, and you know, they got some cool photos. I'm like, you know what, last minute, whatever, I'm throwing this in the presentation. It, it just brings this whole area to life. But this was also a section where, you know, we weren't sure that the cave was going to continue because the cave, again, it sumped out. Luckily, the catwalk aptly named, we just went right over the top of it, came down on the other side, the cave, again, it, it, it just kept going. Um, it opened up uh, this next photo. It really kind of shows what happens when the catwalk ends. You just got this massive complex of brimstones, and that picture my son was on down around the corner, but the water just it doesn't boil up from under the, the floor here, but that's where the river reemerges. And while we're up in the catwalk, again, it's another one of those sections where we're up here and the water's way down low. So it's another paleo trunk line. It's just been left high and dry, but very heavily decorated section. Uh, and this is about as far as I uh, uh, tortured my son. I was like, okay, we can turn around here. He you know, didn't have a wetsuit on either than I. He's, he's shorter than I am, so I'm sure the water was you know, up to his eyes. Um, but great section, you know, that there, there were segments of this cave where it really looked like flowstone passages were coming in. We found other caves on the surface, like uh, Newcastle Pit was perfectly in line with a, with a side passage coming in that was just clay filled. And of course, Newcastle Pit was also clay filled. But when they were plotted out, put on the same map, you could just tell that pit, the trunk line, it all used to come in here. So there's just a lot of big, old, dead formations, these massive brimstone pools, and here you know you can see the river down below. And I think in this section, the cave is now somewhere around 30 feet tall. But we're now getting to the area where it's high and dry. So if we were in there and it did rain, we're not going to drown. That's always a big benefit. Um, <laughs> all right, so. Going back, like 
like I told you guys earlier, we were looking for a new entrance to the cave, and we went looking and we found one. And we found a pit in the back of somebody's yard, uh, you know, and uh, there was a description of this pit that said that it was, what, a 78-foot pit, and there was a crawlway at the bottom. And it was, it was uh, well, they never pushed it for a while. And they should have, because they would have found the big cave back in the 60s instead of driving all the way down to Perryville to the big cave. But they didn't do it. But right here in the backyard, uh, we, we, we got permission to go in. We got permission from an adjacent landowner to park in their yard. Um, and this pit entrance takes on a ridiculous amount of water when it rains. Um, again, it's only 78 feet tall, but it was my first vertical pit. Uh, and this is basically my, all my knowledge of, of rope work extends from going into this pit weekend after weekend and doing this 600 foot long belly crawl at the bottom every time, twice, because you gotta go in, you gotta come out. But uh, moving on to this section of the cave, you know, we, we found some pretty cool stuff. This was, this ended up being the main, the biggest tributary coming into the main trunk line of the cave. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't go far. It ends up something out here, and to my knowledge, we've only been there one time, because I've never been back. And it, but that, that's the way this goes sometimes. I can safely say that in the history of man, what, five people have been here, and I can name the dates and the people, and nobody's been there again, guaranteed. Um, but that's, you know, granted, I know people have been down this pit before, and there's quite a story where apparently in the 60s or 70s, they went down hand over hand on a rope, and then of course couldn't get back up. Uh, <laughs> How much weight there is in that, I, I don't know. But, you know, again, this section of the cave, there were some crisscrossing old trunk lines and, you know, just long since abandoned stuff. The water had taken a new route, and that's kind of the general trend in this cave. But even when it does that, there's all these, these really pretty dra draperies, and we started seeing these translucent um, draperies that, you know, they're, they make really good photo opportunities. Uh, this section, or these formations, they're in a section of the cave. Um, me and two others, we made it through, and today it's still not mapped, and right now there's a tree in that pit. The, the loggers dropped a, a tree right in, right in, and a tree top on top of that, so it's kind of a, a pain. But to show you what we were mapping through to get up in that area, this is the, the general trend of, I don't know how many trips we did through that pit, but it was probably 20, 25 survey trips, maybe 30, and 600 feet of that both ways. Um, it's really not that easy. The more flooded it is, the easier. You want it to be flooded at that point, because if you have to belly crawl, exhausting. If you can float along, it's not so hard, right? So now we got this pit over here to the side, and this, this, uh, this is when the cave uh, really kind of got vertical, and we were wrapping up surveying this, this section, and we wanted to know what's at the top of this dome, and take a look at this map later. Well, when we discovered the other pit, we pushed it until we connected that cave to the main Black Valley Cave. At the point, at that time, nobody knew that that pit in the backyard of the, this family was connected to this river cave, much less than nobody knew the river cave was even there. But in the middle of it, there was a 113 foot dome that we were able to get to the top of that is scraping the surface, tree roots, right? So we took the cave radio in and we ended up digging it open. You know, the landowner was more than happy to help uh, get it on. We had it rigged and here again, you can see my son, he's, he's at the top of this 110 foot pit and that was actually when he found out it was on. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't tell him how deep it was. Just the, the story behind that, he's getting ready for Boy Scout rebelling. He'd done it before, 50-foot clips, 50-foot clips. So I'm like, you do something deep at all. I'll show you something cool, but I didn't tell him how big it was. It was a, I, I didn't tell him how deep it was until he was past the point where he can't just say, nope, I'm out of here. But, uh, the, the unique part about this pit is it drops us right into that main trunk line of the cave. And, you know, we... You're, you're safe if the, you're there. It, it, it isn't a flood zone, but not that big of a flood zone. So Edmund and I, uh, he, he's one of the guys who, who did a lot of the mapping in the cave. We did go in there during the rain, and this is where the river was up about two feet. Okay? But this is at a point where if you were to fall in the water, you're not getting back. It'll sweep you away. Um, that's just the way it is, just like any creek. 
you know, that creek is up, you, you can't just cross it by walking across it. Uh, you know, the current's too swift, and in here, it's just extremely confined. Um, he, he, he started to try and cross it, but, you know, if you know Edmund, and some of you do, um, you, you, of course, that's what he was trying to do. Uh, for no other reason than just to whatever. But again, water's up quite a ways. <laughs> but, and, and the, you know, the pit, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's the main way we go in and out of the cave now. It's just, it's the, just the easiest, it's, most, it's the most convenient. Unfortunately, there is a more technical aspect of, you know, uh, training people to be uh, on rope. Uh, there's the safety factor. Um, but, you know, again, you know, it, it's something that, it, it really isn't that difficult. Um, it's a beautiful pit. There's actually two side by side. And when we surveyed this, uh, I think I was on rope sketching for six hours that day. Uh, because the easiest way to survey a pit is to start the bottom up. I can climb and draw, but I can't repel and draw. You know, I gotta have my hands for repelling. Don't need them for climbing. Not with the uh, the rope system that we use. But anyway, enough of that. That's uh, it's still there. We have access. You know, again, it's a great location. But we'll continue on upstream, on through the big stuff. And as soon as this slide loads, John, what did you think of that pit? Was that cool or what? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so this is where the other pit teed off into the mainstream. Okay, and about 10, 10 minutes of this, eh, it's pretty easy. But you get here in Hooper's attic. That's where the fun starts, and you're crawling for the next six hundred feet. Uh, uh, it really is kind of terrible. I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. Um, but upstream, the cave continues to go quite large. Uh, we call this place where the uh, where this this uh, I think we call it the Coral Stream it leads to Joker or Joker's Pit. I think is the actual pronunciation. Um, comes in at the Waterfall Junction. A lot of detail in this area, upper levels crisscrossing all over the place. There's still a dome that actually comes in right here. You can't even see the top of it. It's just, it's just in that one of those spots where, you know, where's that? But coming out of that dome, these massive draperies and this massive brimstone dam. And of course, when we first got into this, you know, we kind of knew we we found Black Fathom because in this pool of water there was a three foot long catfish. <laughs> well, that's not very often that happens. In fact, I've never seen another cave where the fish are that big. Uh, the, the caves in Perry County, even in this one, yeah, you find small fish. But it's inevitable. If anybody, and I know a lot of people live around here, you've seen a lot of sinkhole ponds. Sometimes they fill up, they spill over into another sinkhole that has a hole in it, and now the fish is in the cave. So we'll find golden fish that are have been, you know, your daughter's goldfish that got flushed down the toilet. You know, who knows? But we have seen them. But this, this is where all that water comes in from that other drainage, and it made just a very unique junction area. Uh, but heading back downstream again, the cave is probably the biggest in this section. If I remember right, the ceilings are a consistent 38 feet tall from stream to the top of the the trunk line, which you can see here is crisscrossing both ways. Um, like for, for another reference point, the depth of the cave at the pit entrance that we're using now down to the stream level is actually 164 feet. So it's a 110 foot rappel, but once you get off rope, you still have to travel down another 50 feet just to get to the water. And there's about five feet of bedrock above the bolts in the ceiling where we rig the ropes at. So that gives you an idea of just how far you are underground uh, in this area. So if you think about people trying to explore caves and jump from hole to hole and looking for caves in a sinkhole, depending on the sinkhole, it's not exactly something you just want to go stomping around. Uh, you know, there, there are pits that we found uh, the same way. There's, there's just little low points and, uh, you know, come back a couple years later and now there's a, you know, there's a, there's a pit that's opened up. Um, over this last weekend, there was something else going on. Uh, as you know, there's, there's been a drought, and the water was the clearest in the cave, and this is on Friday, that I've ever seen it. This is in the same spot as that last photo. But the water clarity was such that, you know, even in these deeper pools that are five, six, seven feet deep, you could see the bottom of it. And that's just, it's, it, the watershed is not that clean for that to be available. So 
you know, very beautiful areas. You can see massive ceilings, draperies, and yeah, this is all just just under farm fields and uh, uh, you know under the ridge line. I mean, it goes under M Road a couple. Uh, well, once it runs under DC Road several times. Uh, you know that that's the area that we're talking about here. One thing that I've noticed, and again, this was on Friday. We're in a drought. Well, this formation, I know where this is. That has never been detached before. The last time I was in this area, that was stuck to the ceiling. Um, so the cave is actively changing. Uh, the same thing with another one here, noticed in the same area. You know, and again, this isn't vandals running through the cave breaking stuff. It's just the cave over time wants to just fall apart. You know, and I'm sure the lack of water, the crystal structure, I don't know. It just, it, it's no longer stuck to the ceiling. Well, we continue on upstream. The cave does start shutting down and it becomes a lot more crawly. But it pops up in this area here uh, that we call Moria. And it was actually, Chris and I discovered it on a, on a two-man survey years ago where we pushed on up ahead. And, you know, the cave was only, I don't know, two and a half, three feet tall. But it just... All of a sudden, you crawl out from under a ledge, and it gets much bigger. Uh, in this area, there's candle sticks. There's these massive columns that are still attached. You know, they're not tall by any means, but like that, as you can see, Edmund hanging out there. You know, it's a good uh, dimension of diameter. But even some of those in that area have become, become detached from the ceiling and are leaning over. So it's just kind of the natural, uh, you know, phenomenon of the caves. Eventually, they just, they just fall apart. Erosion takes place in more ways than one. This is one of those snake fossils that I was telling you about. It's just like it landed on the perfect ledge. Uh, it is stuck down. Um, and then once you crawl out from under that ledge, here's the snake. The ceiling is three feet tall. It pops up to this 38 foot tall section, which is the last large section of the cave heading upstream. And by that, I mean, you know, we, we really thought we were going to be able to follow this massive trunk line forever, but it just shut down on us. But it did kind of go out with a bang. All of this is in that section. You know, very beautiful area. Again, this was this was just last weekend. I had another uh, buddy of mine with his flashes and his fancy DSLR camera. He's a photographer, he's paid from St. Louis, and he takes really good photos. You know, uh, so we're up there having a good time. You know, crawling around in the water. But a lot of the water crawls upstream from here look like this. Really terrible. So now we're getting to that point again. We need to find another entrance. And we know there's got to be another entrance because there's a ton of airflow coming down this thing. And one, where are the fish coming from? Because they're not coming from that pit. I'll tell you that much. So, you know, after, you know, pushing these water crawls and finding all these upper level areas and, you know, getting into all this neat stuff with these translucent, uh, you know, formations, again, the cave, it, it, it's really getting to that point where we're having to work for it. Um, these, these last photos here, are of uh, this, this upper level area uh, in Moria. Again, it all shows that at one time, there was a tremendous amount of water seeping through the rock. Maybe that black is one big massive black solid column. And uh, it, uh, it made all of this all the way down to the base level of the cave. But again, that water's all since dried up. That's what's up in the, up in the upper level. You've got this massive looking thing, so whatever. All right, so we're looking for another entrance. Where's the fish coming from? Well, we had a pretty good idea, and it paid off. Uh, the funny story behind it was I get to the entrance, and uh, which is right here, this is where the cave starts. And I go into it, and I'm like, the cave doesn't go. I'm going to the pit. Who's going with me? And two guys stayed behind, or three guys, and they dug it open, and it, it went, but it went terrible. Um, <laughs> really terrible. But uh, again, when it rains, this is what happens to it. So the entrance here is underwater. Now, fortunately, think of, think of all these flood points and these choke points. Only so much water can go through. Well, if the cave opens up on the other side, you're actually safe in those areas. And there's a lot of that going on here. You would just be kind of stuck for a while. But Gary and Edmund dug this entrance open. And it went, I think, 200 feet of this. Uh, uh, 200 feet of this, and uh, that's actually towards the end. Um, where, and you have to go into this wearing a wetsuit. Most of that belly crawl is, is in a wetsuit with no 
water, and if you've ever crawled in a wetsuit and no water, you get extremely hot. Um, but back in the day, when I was telling you guys we surveyed from point to point, we used to use these little tiny lights, and that's how we would see the survey station. We would use the, uh, the Sunto compass, which was a sighting compass, the inclinometer, and we, we surveyed everything we could. Now it's a little easier, but these photos really capture, you know, what we were doing and what we had to deal with to map this cave. And I know you guys are probably thinking, why? <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's got to have a hobby. You know? I know some people are deer hunters and some people are into cars. Well, we do ridiculous stuff like this. We don't get paid to do it. We just want to know where the cave goes. Right? Uh, and, we, and we, amazingly enough, yes, it is fun. Uh, except for the people that never came back after one trip. <laughs> So this is the third, the third snake fossil, or whatever it is, uh, you know, up, up in this same section of the cave. Um, in this same area, the cave does do something fairly interesting. We have an upper level and a lower level. We have a, an area called the Squid Drops, where there's, there's a few three-foot waterfalls followed by an 11-foot waterfall, and then the cave does a 180-degree turn and goes right back under itself before it continues downstream. And when you're at the top of that, it looks like the cave is done. And when you climb down it, if you turn the wrong way, it looks like the cave is done until you turn around and find out, oh no, that's not the end. But it does open back up from three feet tall, three feet tall, and it opens back up to seven feet, four and a half feet. Again, for as much crawling there is in the upper section, it does have quite a bit of walking. Um, and it does stay big for, for quite a while. But as you can see, the floor is large cobblestones and it's all cemented together with clay and it doesn't move out of the way so you're crawling over bowling balls that don't move and it, it's just it wrecks your wrists your knees just your whole body so really i'm kind of wondering why we did do it <laughs> yes we did because i'm not really selling the appeal <laughs> but, uh, you know coming in through there this is probably the most crawling in the cave now some of it is flooded, so that those flooded sections, they're not hard to get through uh, at all. But if they were dry, it definitely would be torture. Um, this section of the cave did have uh, the only red ochre formation that we did find, it's still there, it's still flowing, just a higher than normal iron content. Um, sometimes, whoops, let me go back. Put my glasses on, I see how to do that. Um, so, Along came the day that uh, we've got all this survey coming up from the, the historic entrance and these two pit entrances and everything's connected together and we're surveying in from this lake entrance and this is the day we tied it all together. Uh, if I remember right, this was September 12th of 2010. I know it was September, I know it was 2010, but here you can see Chris Hartman, he, he kind of spearheaded the whole thing, he drew the map, you got Bob Lurch, Dr. Bob Lurch, Joseph Corden, Dan Lamping, uh, Natalia and Mike uh, Tennant, Sean Williams, myself, and Gary Resch, uh, and then of course the photo was taken by Ed, but he, you know, cameras these days, you can't, you couldn't do this then. Now you just put your phone up, hit the timer, and it takes a great photo. But that was, that was a great day, that was kind of the connection trip, and I think at that point the cave was now six and a half miles long. But everything easy was now done. Um, several years ago, I got this wild idea to go back to an area called the New Discovery, which is only 45 minutes upstream from the entrance. And uh, I took Michael Bradford with me, and we got the muddiest in this cave that I've ever been. And we were wearing vertical gear, and we were trying to get up in this upper level that actually was 54 feet above the stream. But it was a very tight 54 feet. But eventually it paid off. We did get up there rigged some ropes, went back, and over the course of, I think, three years, just said, well, I don't really want to go back there, but I want all my ropes back, and I want all my anchors back, so, and the only way they're coming out is to go map everything. But we got up into this section, and again, just like every other part of the cave, heavily decorated, um, long since abandoned, and these formations, yes, they do seem like they're still alive. Uh, unfortunately, I thought this was going to go. I really did because it's 54 feet above the stream, but unfortunately it shut down right behind Gary's light there. But at least it was decorated, um, and it, it gave us some pretty stuff. But you can see how the formations are broken off there. That is very prevalent in the cave. 
in caves in the Ozarks that have been uh, visited since the 1800s. You know, people were going in there with hammers and breaking stuff off and taking them home and then either, uh, you know, a souvenir or whatever. This is all natural. Again, the, the formations grow and eventually they fall apart. Now, one thing we don't do anymore, as you, you saw a photo earlier, was surveying with the tape, the compass, and the inclinometer. Nowadays, we have an instrument called the Disto X. And it really makes it so we can survey just about anything because it is a, uh, a laser measuring uh, laser measuring device, but it records the compass, the inclination, and the distance down to the hundredth of a foot with one shot. And we just write that down, get back sight, sketch it. So it, the way it used to be is you had to look for a good spot to get a compass over the top of and get, a, get an inclinometer off the side and be able to pull tape. Well now, if you put your disto here, you shine that laser, I can hit any of those points, put a dot on the wall, let's go with it, and we just we can fly through it. And we can map otherwise terrible stuff that, that would be extremely uh, time consuming with a tape and compass. Um, again, up in this area, you know, it was just a really cool area, and it had the one area of the cave uh, which I haven't seen these anywhere else. I know they're not very common, but they're formations that are called uh, mammal berries. And that's this. So this is a lily pad, which is long since dried up, right? But you have all these little other formations that formed underwater. And, uh, well, you can, you can look at them. These are, I mean, they're, they're called mammal berries for a reason. I didn't name them, but that's what they're called. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that, that's up there. That's in an area, I don't know, only a couple... I think three people have been up there to see that, um, which is why I got the photos. But it, it was a pretty well exposed area. It was uh, very brittle canyons. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time rigging <coughs> up in there and making stuff. And once we were done mapping, I took it all out, de-rigged it all. So there's no reason to ever go back. You know, we. But that's what we do. We're not just in the cave, you know, running around. I mean, I love a good wreck trip, just going to caving for the sake of going to caving. But in some areas, you know, you do one trip in, you map everything, and then there's really no need to go back. And unfortunately, that's, you know, the aftermath is, you know, everything is crashed. You know, we, we Gary and I did this trip and de-rigged all this. It was a little in over my head. I, I remember I was probably more tired after this trip because I was carrying out a backpack full of mud <laughs> that also had a rope in there somewhere. And it, it just, it was terrible. But to kind of wrap it up, the fish I talked about, I don't have a lot of photos, but, but they were in there. Um, the, so that would be what, a grass carp, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, a regular carp. But there's this one spot in there that's called Orca's Last Stand. And uh, it was like a bucket of fish. And the sad part is it doesn't look like that anymore. But but these are all two and a half to three feet long, and we would just walk along, and that's what you have to crawl through. <laughs> so, the, now the fortunate part is, you know, some of the fish would live, they would go all the way out through the spring. The real unfortunate part is, after a flood event, a lot of them would get beat to death and die, and then they would just be sitting there rotting away from the, until the next. So, of course, you can imagine the cave smells like... Terrible. So you're hoping for rain for, for another flood event. But uh, I can show you after this last slide, this is more of a thank you uh, that I definitely wanted to give to everybody who contributed photos to the cartographers. Uh, because on the, on the map, you know, we did put a lot of uh, all the satellite caves that were in the area. <coughs> so we had photos here. Again, this, you know, uh, you know, Chris Hartman, who is here, Edmund Tucker, Doug Kettler, Bob Cat, uh, can't even pronounce his name, Bob Cat, um, Don Biddle, Michael Bradford, Derek Fulton, and Dave Vanell, Coriolis, and myself. Uh, the cartographers, again, Chris Hartman drew the black fatted map. I've made minor edits, added little things here and there, uh, but I also imported maps drawn by Aaron Addison and Paul Hawk. Uh, but really, a special thanks to the landowners. There's some of you in, in here that have led us on your property over the years, um, which is a big thanks. But I'll wrap it up by showing a short video clip that I'm sure is going to be extremely laggy on here. But the fish, the fish was the unusual part. I don't think 
this is going to stream too close, but <laughs> actually it's doing a pretty good job. When, when the guys first discovered the cave and they were swimming upstream into the unknown, they were getting hit underwater in water that was 15 feet deep by fish. Couldn't see them, but they were getting hit by them. So they knew something, something was weird, and every time they got to shallow water, there would be fish swimming in it. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff we were surveying through, which also, it did make the cave fun, because if anything else, when you're bored, go warm yourself up trying to catch a carp. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was a lot of it, but, you know, and I say, unfortunately, the fish aren't there anymore, and that's simply because the, the family that owned the lake that would spill over into this cave entrance finally put probably three or five or ten layers of fencing where the water gets through but the fish for the most part. I mean, think of it, if you have a, a stocked pond, every time it rained, they would fill the cave up full of fish. And they were losing, losing all their fish. So when I was in there this past weekend, there were there were catfish everywhere in the cave, but unfortunately they were they were babies. But it was kind of like, wow, if these things were all big, this would be just like it was ten years ago. But uh, that's, that's kind of, you know, gives you, anybody here an idea who didn't know there were caves in San Francisco. And yes, they are. They are big, and they are extremely decorated. So, I put up with that. If anybody has any questions about it. When you gave the number of caves, is an entrance to the main cave, is that, do you describe that as a cave, or is there... What, yes, so I guess I should cave. clarify, that would be around 250 cave entrances, because this cave has four, okay? Um, there's another cave that's almost a mile long nearby that has three. Uh, there's one on the other side of the interstate. Um, by that I mean the interstate cuts the county in half, in my opinion. On one side is this one, on the other side is another large cave. That one has three entrances as well. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's, so, so yeah, there's 250, give or take, I forget the exact number, but there's around 250 cave entrances. So let's just say there's 230 caves, because there, there are about, if I had to ballpark it, there's probably about 20 entrances that all lead to enough to wipe out 20 caves worth. But that's still 250 entrances into a known cave, some of which are on your mom's property. So how far does a hole have to be before it's considered a cave? In Missouri, that's a that's a good question. In Tennessee, it's got to be 50 feet. Tennessee has over 10,000 caves. So for Missouri being a cave state, we don't have enough caves. Tennessee, they require 50 feet of depth or horizontal distance or a combination. So a 30-foot pit and 20 feet of crawling. If it's 49 feet, dig the wall. <laughs> in, in Missouri, you can turn a cave into the Missouri Speleological Survey as long as it's an appreciable distance. And I've turned in some 20 feet, 20 footers that I appreciated every 20 feet. You know, and, and at the end of the day, here it's kind of you know we'll find cave salamanders in a 20 foot long cave. Well, if you got cave life, then turn it into a cave. The problem in Tennessee, if they if they use those same standards, they probably have 20 or 25,000 caves because they have that many features under 50 feet long. So where do you draw the line? Well, here it's kind of, okay, if it's under 20 feet, it, it's just a, it's just a hole, you know, not really worth tracking, um, but. But, but you, when you describe 20 feet or 50 feet, that's, that's how far a human can travel in it. T typically, yes. But if, if we're mapping, to, to yes, so yes, that, that would be, if you can travel 50 feet through it, or 20 feet through it here, that would be something that we would be like, all right, let's stick that in the database, just, just so we know that there's a hole there. Um, but nowadays, when we're mapping, it's so easy to get to a junction where there's a clay-filled passage, but there's this much where the clay is dried out and shrunk and settled, and you can see 40 feet. Well, the cave goes there. We can't fit, but it's there, so we just shoot the laser down it, record it. We record the length, and, and it shows up on the plot line. The cave is there. It's just filled in. Or we've got to be a smurf to fit Because every hole would have some type of a crevice where the water would run through. Pretty much, yeah. Connect. Yep. Yep. And, you know, we can't fit through, you know. So, well, I can't fit through anything smaller than that. Yeah, that's. So that, that's a good enough answer, right? Anybody else?
Chairman. I got two questions. One is your longest propel and back up the rope in any cave. Oh, in any cave. Oh, okay. And, and two, talk about your cave rescue on a rope last year or two years ago. Going with a dog? Behind <laughs> <laughs> the rope? Oh, uh, in, in St. Francis County, the kid that was stranded? Oh, I did. Well, I want you to talk that. Uh, so the, the deepest the deepest pit in the United States is in Georgia. And I guess I should say that with the deepest pit in the lower 48 is in Georgia. Uh, close to Tennessee, close to Alabama. A lot of caves down there. It's 586 feet deep. And it is ridiculously huge. Uh, I've done that many times. Uh, Alex has done it. But my mother Chappelle is like eight, nine times longer than that. Um, the rescue, so yeah, and inevitably around here, there's really not been any major cave rescues in this area since I got involved. But a couple years ago, yeah, there was a, a kid, I say kid because he's old enough to be my son, and I never thought I'd say that being younger, but I'm at, I guess I'm at that age. But he got in a little over his head, and, and he had to be lowered back to the ground. He was exhausted, he was falling out of his harness, he, he just, it was a bad, bad scenario. So I showed up and, you know, got a phone call from Alex and drove down to uh, St. It is St. Francis County, right? Yeah, and we rigged up a, a three-to-one haul system and, you know, Alex was like, well, we can take him out this other entrance, it's a crawlway. I'm like, man, he'll be crawling for two hours as tired as he is. Or, or three, just bring him up the road. So we did. Um, you know, I mean, I've been involved in the same scenario in Arkansas on New Year's Day five years ago. That may be what you're thinking of, too. I mean, there was a cave rescue. A gal fell and broke her shoulder in, uh, in Arkansas, and it was, a, it was a, you know, horizontal caving, but then there was a pit at the end. And you can do a lot of stuff, but cr uh, climbing, uh, you know, the rope with the system she had with a broken arm is not one of them. So there were a lot, a lot of us that went, but, you know, luckily, again, around here, we... We minimize risk because, yeah, caving, I mean, not, not going to lie, you see the photos, there is risk involved. But with the weather around here, you have to minimize that risk by, okay, there's a storm that can pop up this afternoon. We would be in the wrong part of that cave. Ain't going to chance it. We'll, we'll find something else to go. Or find a different cave to go map that you know is high and dry. And, you know, Paul had one. It took me like five years to map because it was like the fallback every time it was going to rain. I'll just go there because the canyon was, I don't even remember now, 78 feet tall. Well, that doesn't fill up with water, so we'll go there, you know. But the, those kinds of caves around here, because it's a sinkhole plain, they're, they're, they're not very often, you know. They're few and far between, let me put it that way. I mean, there is there is one in Perry County. You can do a lot of mapping in high and dry. I mean, there's cat traps in it from about 20,000 years ago. And, you know. Yeah, so there you go, Bob. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Were you involved with saving the dog? So, <laughs> no. No. But that, that's, uh, that, let me, let me go back a few screens here. So that rescue was in the Moore Cave system. Um, that's actually where the cat tracks are found. Um, and the, let me make this bigger. Oops. This is the Moore Cave system here, okay? This is Perryville, Route 61. This is the new road they built. Oh, this is a touch screen. <laughs> Put this in here. Um, anyway, this is the Moore Cave system. This is that new AC highway that the, the, the uh, <laughs> anyway, that, that the, uh, the replica of the, the Vietnam War Memorial, oh, okay. right there, okay? That kind of gives everybody an idea where this is. So that dog was found, you see where that red blip is? Uh -huh. Kind of found there. The dog lives in a house over here. Oh. So I had a theory that it either was running around in one of these two entrances of the cave, and then a flood pulse washed it in, not very likely because death as the flood took it, right? But there is a 15-foot pit over here the dog probably fell down it uh, and then walked 100 feet, walked 100 feet and said, okay, I'm going to hang out here. But on that same day, we had 37 people in the cave and there's a there's a cave
cave right here and a cave right here, and we were trying to fill in the gap. That gap that has no yellow. So we had pretty much one of the best cave divers in the world. But it wasn't a successful dive attempt. In other words, you guys would have heard about, oh my god, we connected a mile-long cave with a 25-mile-long cave, making the longest or the second longest cave in Missouri even longer. No, that's not what happened. We crawled out of that hole and hey, did you guys hear about the dog rescue? We missed a lot of cat. And these kids and another guy went in to do a quick door-to-door -door for a caving event we had last weekend and Bobcat's kids are, uh, what is the oldest one, 10, 11, 12, running up ahead, hey dad, we found a dog. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not something you hear, and sure enough, they get up there and you know, there's that dog and they pull it out and who cares, I'm gonna fall. But yeah, we were there, uh, who else was there? Gretchen, you were there, Alex, you were not there. Oh yeah, I'm a slacker. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, two months. Two months. And, and now, now, something about that that, that I'll mention here that was not in the news. That dog gave birth to litter of puppies three days previous. So apparently she fattened up a little. I mean, I could starve for two months. I'd look like my son in two months, but I'd still be alive. But in that section where she was found, there was a very small stream. But again, keep in mind, this was during the drought we had this summer. So, in other words, that section she was found in, yeah, it floods violently to the sea. She got lucky, you know. She was uh, making the rounds this weekend at a, at a cave event we had in Perry County. <laughs> no, that, that rescue, yeah, whatever, everybody loves a happy ending, I guess. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Okay. Can you describe, like, when you're mapping, like, on the map, how you, you know, you're, you're taking your long shot, but describe how you get your side views and yeah, so, so one thing I didn't talk about it is that every station we measure off the point, let's say this is the point, you know, we measure to the left, the right, the up and down, we call it an L rod. That gives you like the dimensions right here. And if there was a cave passage this big, is this room going? That's a, that's a good, this is good, this is easy. <laughs> so you measure that at the two station, or I'm sorry, at the from station, and then the two, let's say we're going that way. And back in the day, when you left that tape measure laying on the ground, every curve you can kind of, again, I'm six foot, right? So that's, uh, what we'll call that eight foot, eight, what is this, a 16 foot wide? You just kind of get the know-how of, of using what you know to measure off that straight line. Nowadays with that laser that you saw, the red, the red laser, well, there is no tape measure. So we, we don't pull 100 foot shots anymore. With the tape measure, if we can get a 100 foot shot, we're pulling 100 feet. Why not? Well, you I, know. I did carry my disc uh, line every 10 foot. Yes, and that was the other benefit. With the tape measure laying on the ground every 10 feet, you shoot the left, you put, shoot the right, you put a dash on each side of the paper, you go to the 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, and that gives you a very accurate sketch. Now, if it's just train tunnel, where it's, you know, it's, it's just a perfect elliptical tube, you know, but how often do you find those? I, not very often. <laughs> uh, the maps and drawings of eight, uh, Available to the public? Sort of. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, you can get a hold of the DNR, the MDC, and order all the turned in cave maps that are not restricted in St. Genevieve County, Perry County, any county you want. I don't know what the cost is because usually when one caver buys the disc, here you go, here you go, <laughs> and then you copy it, and then, you know, so I have all the maps. But, but, on top of that, I mean, I have access to that database now, so if anything that I would need, I'd be able to get. But for the general public, you, I, if I'm not mistaken, you can still do that because it's while while these caves are obviously not public property. Um, I mean, the city of Perryville does own an entrance to Crevice Cave now, um, but they don't own all the cave, right? But it, it's it's not like Mark, <coughs> excuse me, Mark Twain National Forest maps. If you wanted all the maps of Shannon County, I'm not so sure that you may get the ones that are on private property, but all the ones that are on Mark Twain National Forest and the Ozark Riverways, the National Park Caves, I don't think you would get those. But around here, almost every cave in St. Genevieve County is a private, you know, landowner. Now, we don't name caves and put coordinates on it, so there's no way you could look at, you know, 
you, there's no way you can use the black battle map to figure out where it is. You know, unless you just simply know where it is because of, you know, you know and, some of you, and some of you do. Uh, but I'm not going to say where it is. You know, that's just not what we do. Uh, you know, so I guess, yeah, if, if you're that interested and you just want to look at cave maps that have been turned in since the 60s, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, you can contact the DNR. Um, you know, back in the day, a lot of caves were obviously named after landowners, just like the Ogre's Pit. Well, if you're a pretty savvy person, you could probably figure out where that cave is. <laughs> but that's not obviously who owns the property now. It's been sold even since when we were there. The people that owned it when we were mapping it, they don't even own the property anymore. I tried to buy it, but that didn't happen. So <laughs> <laughs> you know. Any other questions? I do. I have sure. two questions. Okay. Are there lots of bats in there? No. And Not in there. But I did see one last weekend. One? One. Yeah, and it was in a flooded park. It was like, what? <laughs> really here? Yeah, we were, we were, we oh gosh, three hours from the upper entrance of the cave, and it's possible it flew out of the, or came in the pit that we came in, but it was in, a, you know, it was in a low crawlway. It wasn't in the big, but Black Bottom, it, in, in the in the paleo trunk lines that crisscross, um, there are bat stains on the walls from historical colonies that would have been there. I don't know, but yeah, we've never. I think the bats are smart enough to stay out of that. Mm -hmm. And then what was your second? The second one. What will happen if there's an earthquake in this area? Hopefully nothing. <laughs> but the the most unstable part of the cave is the end. Right? Because that's where all the weathering takes place. In the wintertime, you've got water freezes, cracks, there's frost wedging, you know, just like the cliffs along the interstate, right? In the wintertime, when do they fall apart? They don't usually fall apart in the summertime, but you'll notice a big boulder that peeled off in the wintertime. But depending on the entrance, even then it wouldn't matter. Like that Joker's Pit entrance, Joker's Pit entrance, very heavily weathered from the water. There really aren't cracks. And there's some, but it, it's the overhanging entrances, like the one that takes all the water on where the cave starts, that's just a rock shelf overhang. And, you know, yeah, water seeps in there, it expands, it, 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 it dislodges. So, in, in the 60s, there's down here by Longtown, on down 61, there, there's a, there are two large cave systems, Mystery and Rimstone. Combined, they would be 30 miles long if they could be connected. And if you read the book on the mapping of the Brimstone River Cave, which is an excellent read, unfortunately, and the book is out of publication, but Joe Walsh specifically talked about being in there in the 60s during an earthquake where they heard a low rumble and a ripple of water through the river, and that was it. And they come out of the cave and find out that it's like a six point something. But, you know, to my understanding, earthquakes travel on, well, the, the waves, the shock wave travels on the surface. Not underground. So maybe people should go stay Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just don't stay in the entrance. You get old or, you know, and then walk. But yeah, to, to my understanding, you know, think of it this way. <clears throat> the cave wants to be there. Right? It's there for a reason. So it's pretty stable. Now, the caves do fall apart. They get so big that they can't hold their own weight. The ceiling just collapses in. So yeah, those areas could be prone. Uh, I haven't seen it, but, you know, I don't know. Those two formations that I took pictures of from last weekend, was that dry out from the, the, the drought that we're kind of still in? Because in, in the river cave, there are some big flowstones that have always had cascades of water rippling down through them, and they're bone dry right now. But, I don't know, maybe there was an earthquake in New Madrid, uh, you know, recently that in between now and the last time I was in there, and it knocked those off. Because, you know, I've been in there enough to know that if something falls off the ceiling like that, I hate to say it's like, oh, I noticed that rock move. Well, who else would notice that? <laughs> <laughs> but apparently I did, so you know, whatever. But yeah, unfortunately, Bat Caves in St. Jimmy County, the only one I know of, is up on top of Becca Hills. And, uh, you know, yeah, they stay out of the water, like both of these caves. There's, there's not very many, any, for, for having. 57 miles of map cave and that image right there, I can probably count all the bats you know, on my fingers and toes that we usually see. Yes. Any others? Uh, thank you. So, 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 so,
We have a cell phone that we could be divided on the website. I think it would be right. It's the previous one. It will load up in three hours. Oh, okay. You know, um, I know in, 
I think it's a mystery cave mystery in Perry County. County. There's a well that comes in, but it's not cased. And when the cave floods, the pasture water that's flowing in goes right into the well, and when they turn their faucet on, yeah. <laughs> and then what percent of the uh, caves are in limestone, and are there any in sandstone? And so we'll, we'll use that figure in St. Genevieve County of 250 caves. Yeah. I know of one cave that starts at a sandstone cap. You can see it in the ceiling, and that's it. But Perry County, Perry County does have some cavey features in sandstone, and it's not very many because sandstone is not soluble like the limestone. You know, the, the carbonic acid is what dissolves the limestone. Uh, sandstone has to be weathered away mechanically, so there has to be some kind of crack that starts and then grains of sand roll through it and break off more, and then now you got rocks that can fit through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but that's not very many around here. I know off 61, if you've lived around here long enough, you'll know there are some very large shelters that are visible along 61 north of town, and water does drain through them at the bottom, but again, terrible. I'm not pushing it. I push a lot of dumb stuff. Uh, but I, you know, the sand, that adds, an, that adds another layer of terrible because, you know, mud acts as a lubricator, right? Mm -hmm. Sand just gets in everywhere and now your, your elbows and knees are bleeding and that's, that's when you're not having fun anymore. Any other sketch of the, the, the river area and just kind of blew it up much larger because the a lot of the drafting we do is at 1 to 40 or 1 to 50. So 1 inch is 50 feet. If I remember right, I drew this at 1 to 10, just so that the pit profile, which you can see, would actually be big enough to see. You know, in other words, it's going to be a tiny little, you know, flip. Uh, 1 to 40, a 100 foot pit, or sorry, 1 to 50, a, a 100 foot pit is 2 inches tall. <laughs> uh, and I think if I if I remember right, I drew everything in the cave of one to ten, um, and then just drafted it at the same. Uh, you know, it, most of the time, yeah, you you wouldn't do what I did for this pit entrance. But to me, it was a special thing. It's you know, I was on the trip when we discovered this this entrance from the inside out. It wasn't an entrance at the time, but eventually, and now it is. Um, so yeah, I wanted to I wanted to spend the time to just really go into high detail, and that's why I was on the road for six hours, you know, sketching everything. Because it at the end of the day, it's two pits side by side like shotgun barrels, and you know, I had to map one, well then I had to map the other one and get every tie-in point, you know. And it, it, there, it's like there there is no rule book; you just kind of have to figure it out. It's not land surveying where there's a way to do it correctly. Underground, you kind of have to throw the rule book out the window just to get it done. Because you saw some of the passage that we mapped through, you just you got to do what you got to do. And sometimes the data is, <coughs> and sometimes it's really good. And, you know, but as far as I know, the data on this is good because all the entrances line up with it. You know, there's there's no big blunders that put an entrance on paper a mile away. Everything you know, we, we ran a pretty tight ship when we were out. We had a pretty high, you know, uh, standard, if you want to call it that. When we were so, yeah. so that's out there. Uh, yeah, said well, yeah. So whatever whatever that map says, it is out of date um, because I've, I've done other mapping projects in the cave since then, which have pushed it up to 7.14 miles long. So, anyway, my son has a scooter long. <laughs> well, I hope you all enjoyed it.